afternoon. We are really excited about, um, because he's our boss, no. Um, <laughs> we are really excited for um, the director of our office, Jonathan Sullivan, to present um, it right here, when you're banging your head against the ministry wall. And a lot of this came from some great fruitful discussion from the um, symposium uh, that happened uh, it's about two months ago now, right? Uh, coming up on two months. Uh, and just about what we're supposed to be doing in ministry and thinking outside the box and, our, and asking the questions, are our ministries being effective? And that's really difficult to do. And we often bang our heads against the wall. And why is that? And Jonathan shared some things with us in our office. And we were like, that is awesome. And he's like, well, maybe I should present on that. We're like, yes, yes, you should. So we're really excited for this. I think it's going to be kind of a different kind of presentation uh, than you're normally used to. Um, but it's going to be great. So without further ado, I want to welcome Jonathan up here for... Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick show of hands. How many people were at the symposium this summer? Raise your hand high if you were at the symposium. So a few of you. So just kind of recap, because it was a really great day. And I think those of you who were there would agree, you know, I walked away really energized and excited about my ministry and just bubbling with ideas. And then when I actually got back to my office, I started to think about, all right, how do I actually start to implement this stuff? Because a lot of what Julianne had to talk about was how for so long we've kind of been missing the mark when it comes to a lot of our ministries in terms of catechesis because we've catechized without evangelizing. We have sacramentalized without evangelizing. We've not helped people in our parishes uh, in a good, fruitful way all the time to get to know the person of Jesus Christ before we start throwing all this other stuff at them. Uh, and she encouraged us, as Paul alluded to, to think outside the box about what that might look like, to think charismatically, to think about proclaiming the gospel first and foremost, before we get to a lot of the other secondary uh, kind of teachings within our church, to focus on the person of Jesus Christ. And in reflecting on that, in kind of my own history and ministry, and the times I've gone back excited, only to find that I couldn't actually get anything done, couldn't actually get anything implemented, I remember back to one of the very first leadership books I had ever read. Uh, actually, I think I first read this at the tail end of my, uh, my graduate studies a book called Leadership on the Line by Ronald Heifetz and Marty Linsky, a wonderful book that really helped me to think about some of these challenges when it comes to leading in a particular ministry, leading in general, and about why we don't always get the results we think we're going to get. So I want you to close your eyes for a minute. Picture yourself in your office or at your desk sitting there maybe typing away an email or putting together a new program and your pastor walks into the door and he's got a problem and it's a serious problem. This is a problem that could make or break the parish. It's that serious and he's asking for your help and you stop and you think a minute, you open your drawer pull out a notebook with some kind of program and hand it to him. He takes it back. It solves the problem. You're a hero. You get a 300% increase in your salary. They put a statue up in front of the church of you, and the parish is saved. How many people have had that experience? No one. No one has had that experience because those aren't the kinds of problems that we're able to solve in that kind of way those big, parish-shattering kind of problems, church-shattering problems are not the kinds of things we can just reach into our desk and give someone something and it solves the problem. Because the truth is we don't know how to solve those kinds of problems. In the book, the authors put it this way, leadership would be a safe undertaking if your organizations and communities only faced problems for which they already knew the solutions. That would make it so very easy, wouldn't it? If the only problems we encountered in our ministries were problems to which we already knew the answers. Now, how many of you have had that experience where every problem in a given day you already know the answer to when it comes across your desk? It doesn't happen. That's not the kind of work we're in. And one of the main focuses of this book and why I love it so much is it gave me a framework for understanding why that is by making a distinction between two different kinds of problems. 
So these are some of the challenges facing our church today. And, and Julianne went over some of these. Since 2000, a 44% decrease in the number of church weddings. Since 2000. 10% of Catholic millennials attend Mass weekly. 61% of American Catholics believe in a personal God. For evangelicals, that number is more like 80%. 41% of American adults raised in the church no longer identify as Catholic. And only 45% of our Hispanic Catholic brothers and sisters in America are registered at a parish. That doesn't mean they're not practicing. It doesn't mean they're not at Mass. But only 45% are actually registered at a parish. Who has the solution in their back pocket for these kinds of problems? We often joke when we go to conferences and stuff, that if we knew the answer to these questions, we'd be making a heck of a lot more money than we do in our ministries presently, because we could go from parish to parish and sell them the solutions. But we don't have that. These aren't the kinds of problems we know the solutions to. And the book makes this distinction between two different kinds of challenges, technical problems and adaptive challenges. Technical problems are easily identified. They're usually solved with some kind of cut and dried solution, maybe even a packaged kind of deal. They're often solved by an authority or an expert. You could just bring someone in who's going to solve the problem. The required changes are limited in scope. It's not going to require you to rethink your ministry. And you'll usually encounter minimal resistance when you're engaging in these kinds of problems. So taking kind of a medical exa uh, example, <laughs> A few years back, one of my very active toddlers was playing around and swinging a toy on a rope, and it came around and smacked him in the lip and split his lip open. And he was bleeding profusely. My wife calls me, and, oh, he's bleeding. You know, I think, oh, my wife, you know, she likes to exaggerate a bit sometimes when the children are, no, he really was bleeding pretty badly. Uh, so I had to take him to the emergency room, uh, and they did a technical solution to the problem of the split lip. They just took some uh, sutures and sewed up his lip and gave him some medication to keep infection away and sent him home. It didn't require me or him to rethink the way that we've been living our lives, the habits that we have, except maybe he learned not to swing a toy uh, at the end of a rope. I can tell you that he did not learn that lesson. But, you know, it didn't require any real effort on our part. There was an expert that we went to who solved the problem in a quick and easy way with a proven methodology. That's what we mean when we talk about technical problems. You can go somewhere, get the answer, someone will tell you what to do. A good example in ministry, choosing a new catechetical textbook for your parish. You might convene an ad hoc committee, review our current diocesan and curriculum guidelines, review and discuss the various publications that are out there, recommend a text to the pastor, and then purchase the textbooks. It's a pretty cut and dried methodology. You know who you can go to for advice. You know where to go to get resources. It may take some time to put a committee together and actually review those things. And ultimately, an authority, the pastor, is going to make a decision on what's going to happen by choosing the textbook and then implementing it. This is what a technical problem in ministry might look like. Adaptive challenges, on the other hand, are completely different. They're invisible or difficult to identify. They require changes in our values, our cultures, our roles, our relationships, our approaches. Solutions are developed by those with the problem. There's no expert you can go to. Often requires trial and error, numerous iterations, so trying different things, making little adjustments, seeing if those adjustments work. It often requires change across organizational boundaries. And they are often denied or resisted by those who have or invested in the existing behaviors, values, etc. So another medical example. A uh, year and a half ago or so, our two-year-old daughter was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, there was an immediate problem uh, in terms of her being dehydrated and having very, very elevated sugar levels in her blood. So we went to the emergency room. They were able to, to take care of that, get her levels back down, get her on an IV drip so she gets uh, fluids and everything in her. But now our family is in the process of talking about, all right, what are our values? What are the behaviors we as a family need to change in order for our daughter to have a lifetime of health? 
And there's some technical pieces to that. She has a continuous glucose monitor now, so we get five minute intervals of what her blood sugar is. She just got an insulin pump this past summer, so that she's getting continuous, uh, continuous drip of insulin throughout the day, and we can monitor very closely what her insulin dosage is on. But a lot of that is breaking some of our own bad habits about how active we are, what our diet consists of. I haven't done a great job of that yet. We have to rethink that because there's no expert who can come in and show us how to do that. It requires us to rethink our behaviors and what we value. If we truly value our daughter's health, we're going to have to make some changes in order to ensure that she has good habits and good values for a lifetime. Again, we can get help with that. Uh, we're very blessed to have a great uh, diabetes specialist that we work with and see on a regular basis, but ultimately it's up to us. They can give us some guidance, but ultimately we have to make the changes. So in ministry, it might look something like this. Keeping kids in our formation programs. We often hear from DREs when we did our parish visits, we would hear this a lot, that you have kids who will show up for sacramental years and then they'll disappear. And then they'll come back. And when parishes talk about this, we often hear them say things like, well, we're going to push back the age of confirmation in order to keep them in the program longer. My previous diocese, I had a pastor who wanted to confirm in 12th grade. He wanted to push it all the way back to 12th grade. We'll sometimes hear, well, we'll require two years of attendance before they can receive the sacraments to make sure they're involved in the program beforehand. In youth ministry, you might hear things like, we're going to mandate that they're involved in some form of formation in order to be able to go on the youth trip or something like that. In order to access the fun activities, we'll make sure that they have to do the other things as well. I would say that this means that we are trying to uh, tackle these problems with a technical approach rather than an adaptive one, in part because we've misidentified the problem. The problem is not keeping kids in our formation programs. The problem is a lack of personal investment in the faith by many of our families, young peoples, etc. And that's a much harder problem to tackle because there's no technical solution to that kind of a problem. It involves culture, it involves behaviors, it involves values. And it requires an adaptive approach, which might look like refocusing on evangelization as the basis for all catechesis, forming families in regular faith practices, rethinking the model of catechesis that we use in our parishes, but I can't say what of those would actually work. A lot of it's dependent on your own parish culture. A lot of it depends on the families and young people in your parishes and finding out what's going to attract them, what are their needs. This is, I'll be honest with you, this is one of the difficulties in diocesan ministry because so often people want to come to us and ask for technical approaches to what are adaptive problems. And our role, you know, if, if there's a good program we can give you, we'll point you to that. Part of our role has to be to walk with you in that journey, to help you think about what changes need to happen. What are the problems you're facing? What are the root causes? So again, more than anything, when I was, when I was listening to Julianne over the summer, I kept coming back to this idea that we keep trying to solve our adaptive challenges with technical solutions in the church. So my original title for this presentation was actually Why Your Ministry is Failing. I thought that was probably a little aggressive. <laughs> so we stepped it back a bit. <laughs> it's my ministry too. It should have been our ministry. Why our ministry? Because I'm a part of it too. Uh, but I think underlying it is because we want to find technical solutions to these problems. And it's understandable. Technical solutions are easy. You know, they may be expensive if you're looking at various programs or things like that. Uh, again, my previous diocese, one of the things they wanted to look at was doing the Catholics Come Home campaign in a small rural Illinois diocese, which we wound up figuring would cost $200,000 to hit all of our media markets with those campaigns. But the truth is, when we reached out to other dioceses who'd done it and asked them about it, they said, yeah, we saw about a one-year bump in mass attendance rates, and then we were right back to where we were before. One year was all they got out of it. Now, some places saw more, but those were the places that invested in it. They prepared the parishes. They asked them, all right, we're going to do this. What are you going to do to make sure these people feel welcomed in your parish, that they have a place to go, people to talk to, a 
about why they left the church. It wasn't just a marketing campaign in those places. It was a much fuller approach. They were thinking about their culture, their behaviors, their values. And those kinds of parishes saw a, a better outcome as a result of that program. The rest of them really didn't. This is one of my favorite charts from one of the books these people have written, because I think it really speaks to why these things work or don't work. So the vertical axis here is disequilibrium. How much pressure or pain do the people in our organizations feel when we ask them to change something? And then the horizontal one is just time. So this top one that starts at the top is kind of a brownish color, if you can see it. That represents a technical problem. So imagine implementing a new piece of software in your parish. You know, you've updated your iOS or something and you have to, to completely relearn how to do Word or PowerPoint or anything. It starts with very, very high disequilibrium because you've got to figure out this new program. You don't know how to use it. And so it's difficult. And then that comes down and it kind of wavers a little bit and then pretty quickly you learn the program and then the disequilibrium hits a real low and then from there on you know the program or at least you know what you need to do to get what you need out of the program. And so they can just continue on with very low disequilibrium. This orangish line represents adaptive challenges when we ask people to make changes based on adaptive challenges. The disequilibrium starts very low because people tend to be in denial. Oh, that's not really a problem. This is just Jonathan's soapbox that he's on. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll humor him for a little bit and then we'll, we'll figure it all out. But pretty soon when people start to learn, no, this really is a problem, that this equilibrium starts to come up, and then things really get challenging, and then one of two things happen. Either people start to just resist it, and it just kind of peters out, and no real change happens, or what happens is that this equilibrium hits this sweet spot, which is what that shaded area represents, where things are challenging, but not so challenging that people get upset, and give up, but not so easy that no change is taking place. And part of the task of leadership when we're helping people work through adaptive challenges is try to help people stay in that sweet spot. You know, it's like managing a thermostat. You don't want it too hot, you don't want it too cold. You want it just right so that people feel challenged, they recognize that there's some pressure to solve this problem, you know, there's some energy behind it, but it's not so hard that they give up, and it's not so easy that no change actually takes place. And when that happens, and they're going to go up and down through that sweet spot, but over time, things get easier as cultures change, behaviors change, and real change takes place. This, again, is one of our challenges as leaders in our parishes. And that's one of the distinctions I want to make, and this may just be one of my soapboxes, but they talk about it in the book, and I think it's an important distinction to make between authority and leadership. We tend to conflate those things, but they are not the same. Authority is granted. There is someone who gives you authority. So you who are DREs, youth ministers, you have been given some authority by your pastor to do your ministry. Uh, as an executive director at the diocese, I have been given some authority by the bishop to share in his ministry to serve all of you. It's not something I can give myself. It has to be given by someone. Authority is often role-based. You have authority because of the position you have. If you didn't have that position, you wouldn't have that authority. Authority is easily gained, but is expensive to spend. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. And authority often relies on power. There's a management podcast that I really enjoy, and they make a distinction between three different kinds of power. There's expertise power. You have some knowledge of something, and so people come to you because you just know stuff. There's role power. So as a manager, I have some power over the people that I manage. I can tell uh, Evelyn and Paul what to do because I'm, I'm the director of the office. But then the third is what we would call leadership, or better, relationship power. Leadership is earned, it's not granted. Just because someone has a position of authority does not necessarily make them a leader. Leadership
leadership is not reliant on an individual's role. And you can probably think about people in your parishes who don't have any formal role but exercise leadership. People look up to them. They appreciate their advice. They go to them when there's problems. Leadership is hard to gain but cheaper to spend. And again, what I mean by that is it's hard to gain leadership because it relies on trust. It requires relationship. I can't just walk up to someone and be a leader to them. I have to get to know them. They have to know they can rely on me. I have to have a history with them of proving that uh, not only do I say good things, but I do good things. They know that uh, it's not just going to be hot air coming out of my mouth when I say I'm going to do something. You know, it takes time. It's hard to gain. But it's cheaper to spend because once someone trusts you, they build a habit of trusting you. And if they really know you, even if you let them down, they know, well, they didn't mean to let me down. Something else interfered or happened. And so they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Working out of authority, again, authority is easily gained. But once you've spent authority, it's harder to get it back. You know, I can tell Evelyn and Paul what to do, but if I just seem capricious or overbearing and tell them to do stuff without explaining why, then I'm spending my role power, I'm spending my authority, and it's going to be harder to get back. It's much better to work out of leadership because that builds trust over time. You get better results. So adaptive challenges rely on leadership. So here's some things to keep in mind when you're thinking about adaptive challenges in your parishes. Start with the end in mind. What is your goal? What is it we're trying to do? You know, thinking back to Julianne's conversation with us, it's about making disciples of Jesus Christ. In the back of our mind, that should always be part of our calculation when we're thinking about programs, thinking about changes. How is this going to help us to make disciples in a better way? But whatever program we're talking about, what's the goal? And I'll, make, I'll put a plug in for Pizza Inside and Hugs here. Because that first episode is really, really good on this. About identifying wins in your ministry. About building goals into your ministry. Start with that in mind. Know what you're trying to accomplish. Because then you can start to build a map on how to get there. <laughs> Keep asking questions. Uh, I'm kind of notorious for this. I love playing the newbie. Uh, I, I like being in positions where I'm the new person in the room. Because then I can ask the obvious questions that no one's asking. And that's one of the major challenges in adaptive leadership. In challenging adaptive challenges. Is naming the elephants in the room. And there tend to be a lot of those in our ministry. Assumptions that people are making, issues that people don't want to deal with. Uh, you have to be tactful about that. Sometimes it may not be the best time to ask a question in a meeting, but at least know that the question is there. I find sometimes just the, the easiest question to ask is, why are we doing it that way? You know, what's the history behind that decision? Because then you start to get into questions of, well, do the assumptions of why that decision was made still hold? Or have things changed? Maybe there's a different approach we need to take. Ask questions. It's a great way to get people to start thinking about the challenges in front of us. Engage multiple audiences. And this is another major theme in leadership on the line. We cannot be one-person shows in our ministries. Because then it all falls on us. And, you know, I, I, I said when I came onto the diocese, I was glad there's not an office of evangelization in the diocese. And a lot of dioceses are doing that, and in some places they're necessary. But in some ways, I like not having that office in our diocese. Because it means no one person is responsible for evangelization. It can't rest on one person. We all have to be responsible for evangelization. Whether we're in the family office, or catechesis, or divine worship in the catechumen, or Catholic schools. That has to be part of all of our ministry. We can't just rely on one person. Which also means then that when it fails, we can't just blame one person. So we need to engage multiple audiences. Ask questions of multiple people. Get different opinions. Build up that reservoir of shared wisdom together so that we're all focused on the same challenges. Acknowledge the pain. Because as the graph showed us, in order to meet adaptive challenges, it's going to require a certain amount of pain. It's going to take some disequilibrium. Acknowledge that with people. Say, I know this is hard. I know this is asking you to do things differently. I know this isn't what you expected when you joined this ministry. 
but this is what we need to do in order to be effective. This is what we need to do in order to be faithful to the mission that's been given us by Jesus Christ. We need to acknowledge that pain because it is real. And when we don't acknowledge it, then people think we're being disingenuous or that we're asking too much of them or that we don't realize how much we're asking of them. Part of that relationship, part of that trust, acknowledging the pain. Don't sprint. I don't remember where I, I, this has been one of my mantras for a couple of years now. Ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. And I know that's not a big, huge insight or anything, but it's something I have to constantly remind myself that we are not going to solve these problems in three months. <laughs> We're not going to build good programs in three months. It's going to take time. It's going to take trial and error. It's going to take experimentation. And so we need to keep the long view in mind. Being concerned with you know, short-term results as well, but always asking, all right, I know what this looks like in the short term. What does this look like in the long term? One thing that I think Julianne asked us was, you know, think about the kinds of changes you could make in your parish that would make a difference 20 years from now. What does that look like? What do you want your parish to look like in 20 years? Or 50 years? Or 100 years? What does the ministry look like when you're gone? And you think that far ahead. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And finally, fail fast. This is a mantra in the tech industry. Uh, the idea here is not necessarily that we want to fail, but it's that failure is just another data point. It gives us information, because now we know what doesn't work. <laughs> and sometimes not knowing what doesn't work can be as important as knowing what does work, because it can point you in the right direction. So the idea in the tech industry is start small, start with a rough draft and put the rough draft out there, and then let people give you feedback. And then tweak the draft. Put it out there again, get feedback, tweak it some more. And do that as fast as possible, so that you're getting these rapid iterations improving incrementally. What that does is, number one, you see improvement, instead of just saying, well, it has to be perfect before I launch it, which is one of my cardinal sins. Uh, I, I'm a perfectionist. I would prefer things to be perfect before I put them out there in the world. But we need to get it out there because that's where ministry happens. It doesn't happen when we're trying to put the perfect font into our newsletter at our desks. It happens when the newsletter gets sent out. But what it also does is it engages people in the process. When you ask for feedback, people see that they're valued, that you want their advice, that you care about how what your ministry is doing affects them. So asking for feedback, responding to that feedback as quickly as possible, but not being concerned about perfection. Because that won't happen until Jesus comes back anyway. Any comments, questions on that? Like I said, th these aren't huge insights. They're certainly not my insights. But it's a framework that has really helped me in my ministry to think about the way I need to approach the challenges I see in my ministry so that I'm not trying to put a technical solution to an adaptive problem that's just going to kind of bandage over it and not really solve anyone's problems. Uh, I've got a little exercise here where I'm going to give you some scenarios, or Evelyn's going to pass out some scenarios about typical kind of problems we might see in a parish. And so I want you at the tables to read your little scenario and then start to think about how would you approach this. Ask yourself, is it an adaptive problem or a technical problem? If it's an adaptive problem, what's the underlying challenge? What values, behaviors, roles may need to change? Who could you engage in the process of change? What resistance do you anticipate? If it's a technical problem, what's the desired outcome? What experts do you need? What resources do you need? And who is going to decide on the solution? Now, I'll give you a little hint. There's often overlap in these. Whatever challenges we face will often have some underlying adaptive challenges to them, but oftentimes there'll be some technical piece to it as well. So don't think it's necessarily going to be an either or. Uh, a lot of these scenarios you could very easily find pieces from both. So what I'd like you to do is take, let's say 15 minutes, really wrestle with this. Uh, keep asking questions. Uh, 
and you know, if it's helpful to jot notes, do that. But then we'll come back and just kind of report out on our scenarios uh, and some of the uh, the things you found within them. So, 15 minutes. Let's take this for table table talk with our scenarios. <laughs>